Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews gathered there, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify, crucify. But Jesus answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jewish leaders insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he added, asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realise I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a great sin. From then on, Pilate tried to get Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Jesus heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which is Aramaic for Gabbatha. It was the day of the preparation of Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which is Aramaic, is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on each side of Jesus, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them among four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. The garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, his disciples took her into his home. Later, knowing that everything had now been fulfilled and so that scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now it was the day of preparation, and the next day was to be a special Sabbath, because the Jewish leaders did not want the body left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. 
The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who had been crucified with Jesus, and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus and found that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a great pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you may also believe. These things happened so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken, and as another scripture says, they will look on the one they have pierced. Hey everyone, uh, it's great uh, to be with you again, looking at uh, John's Gospel uh, with you. An apology for the lack of slides, we didn't get our act together and put the, the scriptures and all my slides up there. Um, that'll be rectified hopefully tomorrow, but that's not of any benefit to you, sadly. Um, anyway, uh, as we are uh, in the lead up to Easter, it's uh, interesting to note that uh, the Apostle Paul says that the whole Christian message can be reduced to, the, uh, as he describes it, the message of the cross. In fact, at one point he says, I resolve to know nothing among you, Corinthians, except Jesus and him crucified. When the Christians decided on a symbol that would, uh, they would rally around, uh, it's interesting that they didn't choose a symbol that represented the victory and the power of the resurrection, which is an essential part of the Christian gospel, uh, but they chose the symbol of the cross, and most people nowadays, because we see, wear these kind of gold crosses around our neck that look beautiful, uh, they kind of forget uh, that the symbol was actually a symbol of horror uh, for those in the Roman Empire. I mean, the Romans used it as a political statement. This was the fate of anyone that stood opposed to Rome. And for the Jews in particular, um, they uh, knew that their Old Testament law said uh, that cursed was anyone by God who was hung up on a tree. And they considered crucifixion as a way of hanging someone on a tree so that they were under the curse of God, rejected by God. And that's why, when you think about it, the Jewish leaders in particular wanted Jesus to be crucified. Uh, this would make a statement, wouldn't it? Because here is this man claiming to be the Son of God, claiming to be the Messiah, but in actual fact, he's cursed by God and rejected by God. And this is why it really seems crazy uh, that as we started looking at this section from last week, that for Jesus, this was the time, this was the moment that would capture his mission on earth. His crucifixion, he describes as his crowning glory that captures what he was all about. And he himself said that this event, this moment, as he hung on the cross, would be the moment that he would draw all people to himself. People from all over the world would come to him. It may be a picture of horror. John, the writer of this gospel, is telling us, but look carefully and you'll also see in it, on display, the glory, the wonder, the beauty, the love of God, like no other moment in history could ever capture. And this year, um, our aim in the EU is to invite people to meet Jesus. And we're encouraging uh, students and people really everywhere to meet Jesus. And we've got those events uh, that are running next week, both at Ride and at Barney's down at Broadway. Um, and that would be a good time to uh, invite your friends along to meet Jesus. Or if you're here and you're interested in finding out more about Jesus, that would be a really good event uh, to go to. I really commend those to you. But my hope uh, for all of us here today is that you'll do what Pilate tells us to do there in verse 5. I hope you've got your Bible open there in front of you or your device open. Verse 5, where he drags Jesus out in front of the crowd and says, here is the man. I actually think a better translation is the old translation where it says, behold the man. Pilate is putting Jesus on display before them and telling everyone to look at Jesus. Behold the man. And really, it's not just Pilate who is telling us to do this, but also John, the, the writer of the gospel, who we can actually hear telling us to look at Jesus at this point. Um, behold uh, the man. If you want to check Jesus out, then uh, you can't just look at all the wonderful miracles 
that Jesus did throughout his life and, and listen to all the wonderful teaching that he did. Sure, he did spectacular things like healing the sick, controlling nature, walking on water and even raising uh, the dead. And it was amazing uh, how good and powerful Jesus was as he walked on this earth. But you also have to look at him now at this point where he has been flogged and bashed around by the Roman soldiers. He's been mocked with a crown of thorns and this scarlet robe that hangs around his shoulders. And he's dragged out in front of all the people, an object of pity and ridicule. Behold the man. Now, this is a great time to be looking at Jesus. And lots of artists have actually recognised this and painted uh, drawings, uh, uh, paintings of him. And I, I, I had some on, on the slides, but sadly you can't see them. But I encourage you to, to Google them. Behold the man. So let's spend some time looking at Jesus here as he is led to the cross. And, and one of the clear things that you should be um, noticing about Jesus throughout this whole uh, episode is his innocence. Three times we're told by Pilate, the judge, who's about to execute Jesus, that he finds Jesus innocent. We read it last week in, in chapter 18, verse 38. If you just flick back there, you can see Pilate tells the Jews, I find no basis for a charge against him. And, and here in chapter 19, in verse 4, look, I'm bringing it out to you to let you know that I find no charge against him. And verse 6, but Pilate answers, you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. And even in verse 12, Pilate again tries to free Jesus, but the Jewish leaders dissuade him from it. Behold the man, Pilate is saying, he is innocent. He doesn't deserve to die, let alone be tortured to death on a cross. And we're told in uh, verses uh, 1 to 3 that the soldiers take Jesus, flog him, uh, twist a crown of thorns, put, put it on his head. Uh, they clothe him in that purple robe and then they bash him. They go up to him again and again, mocking him, hail king of the Jews, and slap him across the face. And so as Pilate is dragging Jesus out, Jesus would have been battered. He would have had stripes all across his back. He would have been bleeding. Black eyes, probably bruised cheeks battered and bruised, an object of pity. Behold the man. And clearly Pilate is hoping that this roughing up of Jesus by the soldiers would kind of satisfy the Jews, that they would take pity on him. And he's kind of saying to them, look, I, I kind of pulled his teeth. He, he, he can no longer bite you. He's harmless. Let's just let him go. But the Jewish leadership refuses to be satisfied and they just bay for his blood, crucify Crucify, they shout. Nothing short of total humiliation, nothing short of death will do for him. And it says, uh, here he is, behold the man, totally humiliated, without pity. Well, Pilate clearly doesn't want to crucify Jesus. Uh, he, he may find no basis uh, for his guilt, but the Jewish leaders claim can, and they say to Pilate that this man claims to be the son of God in verse 7. And that, that for them is uh, proof enough that Jesus deserves to die. It doesn't really matter to them whether this claim is true or not. It's just that he's claimed it and that's enough. Uh, this news actually freaks Pilate out. And so he tries to ask Jesus where he comes from. And if you've been reading through the gospel, you'd notice that this is a fairly hot question uh, that gets brought up again and again in the gospel because everyone thinks uh, they kind of know where Jesus is coming from. And this is the subject of debate as to prove whether he is uh, the actual Messiah or not. Um, he's from Nazareth, they say. And what good thing can come from Nazareth? A bit like us saying, what good thing could come from Queensland or something like that, depending on uh, where you, uh, nothing wrong with Queensland, but you know, we don't really like it, no. Um, <laughs> but the Messiah, that, according to the Messiah, can't come from Nazareth. That, that's reason to rule him out. But Jesus tries to point out to them again and again, you're just looking at his human origin. Beside the fact that I was, actually I was born in Bethlehem, you're just looking at the humanity, uh, the human origin that, is, uh, that I have. But Jesus keeps on telling them, actually, I come from God. 
I am from above. God is my father and I am his son. I am from above. I'm from heaven. You're missing the point. And so Pilate asked him, where, where are you from? And whereas all along to the Jews, he's been boldly declaring where he's from. Before Pilate, he says nothing. And so Pilate says to him in verse 10, don't you realize that I have power to either free you or crucify you? At which point Jesus does actually point out to him that he actually comes from above. The power that you have actually comes from above, from God. Uh, which points to two things, really, that Jesus, uh, three things, that Jesus is claiming to be from God, I think, is a roundabout way of, of doing it, but it's clear there, that the power that Pilate has to humiliate Jesus, uh, to flog him, to slap him, to mock him, actually comes from God, which, when you think about it, is kind of bizarre. And thirdly, but this doesn't absolve Pilate nor the Jewish leaders of their guilt in doing all that they are doing to Jesus, even though it is God's plan. So behold the man, innocent, unjustly humiliated, without pity, and yet all this is from God. Now once again, we're told that Pilate tries to release Jesus, but the Jewish leaders won't let him off the hook. Uh, they play the trump God by uh, backing Pilate into a corner in verse 12. They say to him, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. I mean, to be anything in the Roman Empire, you had to be a friend of Jesus, uh, of Caesar, I should say. E even a false rumour that you weren't uh, could lead you to become nothing, lead you to, to die at Caesar's hands. So no matter how innocent Jesus is, Pilate will not sacrifice his own political career for him. So he brings out Jesus once again, dramatically sits on the judgment seat. He puts Jesus on display and he says, here is your king. And once again, in the original, it really is, behold your king. Look. This is your king. And it forces us to consider because we, we hear again the echoes of John, the apostle, the writer of this gospel, telling us, behold your king. And so we're forced to ask immediately, well, is he my king? Now you could be like the Jews in verse 15 who reject him as their, their king. Take him away, take him away, crucify him. And Pilate taunts the, the Jews, shall I crucify your king? And they say, we have no king but Caesar. Did you notice who says this in verse 15? John actually points to not just the Jews in general, but specifically to the chief priests, the religious big dogs who run uh, the whole religious establishment of the Jews, who ought to know better, who are the teachers of uh, the Jewish people uh, about God. And yet here they are claiming that Caesar is their only uh, king. You should immediately uh, be asking yourself, well, what about God? Isn't he meant to be Israel's king? And this really is the echo of the way that God's people again and again rejected God as their king throughout uh, their history. It's the story really of the whole of the Old Testament. In fact, about a thousand years uh, before Jesus, when they asked for a human king, uh, this was the point that God made to them. When, by asking for a human king, you've actually rejected me as your divine king, as your rightful king. And prophet after prophet makes it clear uh, that the real deep-seated problem for Israel, for, for God's people, is that well, and, and that really causes all their problems to, to, to really pan out, is that deep in their hearts they have rejected God as their rightful ruler, as their king of their lives. And Jesus repeatedly says to the Jews throughout his ministry that they reject him and hate him because, in actual fact, they rejected and hated God all along. You see, if you don't want God as your king, because deep down in your heart, you want to be your own God. You want to call the shots in your own life. You want to do what you want to do. 
I want to be king over me. I don't want anyone else to tell me what to do. Well, if God shows up in the flesh, then don't be surprised that you reject him, despise him and get rid of him as your king. And this really isn't just for the Jewish people that this is said. It's for everyone because the cross of Jesus really is humanity at large rejecting God. God has come in the flesh. What do we do? Let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. It's Israel all over again rejecting God. It's actually Adam and Eve back in the garden rejecting God, telling them what to do, setting themselves up as their own God. And really in each of our hearts, you have to realise that we're either going to follow Jesus and allow him to sit on the throne or we reject him and nail him to the cross that's in our hearts as we say, no, you will not be my king. Way back in the very beginning of the gospel, in chapter 1, verse 10 to 11, we're told that Jesus, the word of God, he was in the world, and though the world was made by him, the world didn't recognise him. He came to his own, that's to the Jews, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed on his name, no matter who you are or what you've done, he gave them the right to become children of God. Behold your king. Will you have him as your king, even though he's not very popular? Even though the majority of the world reject him and want him crucified? Will you have him as your king? Then in verses 16 to 18, we're told that Jesus is led away, carrying his own cross to be crucified in the middle of two other criminals who were crucified with him. And what's often surprising to many people is um, we don't really get much description, much detail here of how gruesome and barbaric Jesus' crucifixion was or how agonising it really was for Jesus. It's simply stated here in, in two words. They crucified him. Well, in three words. Behold your king crucified. His throne is a cross. And what details there are are quite surprising details, really. And we're going to go through some of these details because what we're told here in these details is really it opens up for us the significance of what's going on. It tells a bigger story than what we're seeing with our eyes. Uh, like the sign, for example, uh, example, the notice that Pilate put on the cross above Jesus and the, the protest that the Jewish leaders make to Pilate uh, to alter that notice. In verse 19, it reads, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And the Jews, Jewish leaders want him to change it, say that this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. And Pilate just simply says, what I've written, I've written. It's, it's written. It's done. But did you notice in verse 20 that it's written, we're told in Aramaic and in Latin and in Greek. Aramaic was the language that the Jews commonly spoke. Um, Latin was obviously the, the, Rome, uh, the language of the Roman uh, people. But for the rest of the world who were under the Roman Empire, they spoke Greek. That was their common lang language. This is a way of saying that this needs to be heard by all, whether you're Roman, whether you're Jewish, whether you speak Greek. This is a message for all the world. The one on the cross... This Jesus of Nazareth is the king of the Jews, really, the king of the world. I mean, when you think about it, it really is kind of bizarre that we Christians claim Jesus as our king. He's a Jewish king, this small, insignificant backwater kind of country in the middle of nowhere that has never really risen to prominence in the world. I mean, it'd be like me suggesting to you, really, the king of Tonga, well, you should make him your king because he is going to be the king of the world. And you're going, well, what are you, crazy? <laughs> That's, in, in, well, no uh, apologies to you if you're from Tonga. I'm not trying to belittle you in any way. It's just a way of illustrating. But that's really what we're doing when we're acknowledging Jesus, the king of the Jews, as our king. And we're saying that he is the one, this king of the Jews, is going to be the king of the world. That's why we're making him our king. It's 
So behold your king, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, really the king of the world, rejected by his own people, crucified by the Romans, a dying man, and yet my king. Behold your king. And the next strange detail uh, is given in verses 23 to 24 is one of the soldiers casting lots for Jesus. I mean, lots of things were going on. Why this detail? Well, John wants us to see that this really is pointing us to something bigger. It's a fulfillment, he tells us, of Psalm 22, verse 18, where, which he quotes. He wants us to really go back to that psalm. And I want to suggest to you that that would be a really good thing in the lead up to Easter. This is a really good psalm for you to read as you reflect on Jesus' death because um, even though it was written a thousand years before Jesus, when Christians read it, they can't help but reflect and suggest this is actually describing Jesus on the cross and the events surrounding Jesus while he's hanging on the cross because it begins with the words quoted in another gospel of Jesus crying out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it speaks in that psalm of a man rejected by other people and seemingly by God himself, even though he is innocent, he's done nothing wrong, he trusts in God. But people pass by, they mock him, they insult him, they shake their heads at him. He suffers incredible agony, he says he's poured out like water. Uh, it's like his bones are out of joints, his heart melts within him. Um, his mouth is kind of dried up, his tongue sticks to the roof of his mouth, dogs surround him, bulls of Bashan surround him, his hands and his feet are pierced. And he's on full display in his weakness so that people stare and gloat over him. And then they cast lots for his clothes. You can help but imagine Jesus really on the cross there at this point, can you? Here is a man, in other words, totally dehumanized, totally stripped bare, that even just what's left of him, his clothes, so that he's naked now, is, is just a lottery is uh, organised for him. He's rejected by humans, seemingly rejected by God, and yet throughout it, he continues to trust in God. And in the end of the psalm, God actually does vindicate him and he leads, this man leads the people, all the people in praise and celebration of God. And as a result, all the nations of the world turn to God. And John is saying to us, if you really want to understand what's going on for Jesus, this pitiful display of Jesus, you need to read Psalm 22. You need to go there because there you get the fuller picture of what is going to happen to Jesus. This is only just a snapshot that will lead to bigger things. Behold your king. He may be stripped bare, dehumanized, rejected by humans, seemingly rejected by God, but he's not totally abandoned by God. God will vindicate him. He will rise again and will impact the whole world. Well, the next uh, funny detail which uh, we're going to just quickly explore is where Jesus speaks to his mother and the Apostle John there in verses 25 to 27. Uh, and just let me summarise this. So I think this is his way of saying that I'm here instituting a new family and from now on family structures will be reorientated. Uh, I, I think this kind of alluding back to the beginning of the gospel in John chapter 1, verse 12, where all who receive Jesus become the children of God. And that's why as Christians, we call each other brothers and sisters. And sometimes we refer to those older than us as our mothers and fathers. Um, it was one of the beautiful things at my dad's funeral was the amount of young people who came up to me and said, he was like my father. And uh, he treated me like his son. And I think that's what you gain as you join the people of God, a new family, a heavenly family. But again, the next detail seems strange as well in verse 28 to 30, where Jesus says, I am thirsty, and then he's offered some wine vinegar to drink. Uh, of all the many details, why this one? It seems bizarre. But again, um, uh, John is just not wanting us to describe what's going on, but pointing to something hugely significant. And I think verse 28 is the key. It says there later, knowing that everything uh, uh, had now been finished and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And the key word, I think, is finished because we note 
Um, in verse 30, Jesus says, it is finished after he takes the drink. And we ought to notice that the word for fulfilled is of the same family of, as the word for finished. It's not the usual word for fulfilled that's, that's often used for scripture. Uh, it's literally so that scripture would be finished, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And, and more than likely, the, the, the psalm uh, that Jesus is referring to, or the scripture that he's referring to is Psalm 69, verse 21, where he says, they gave me vinegar for my thirst. Uh, and it's very much like Psalm 22, again, of this rejected man uh, who, who's suffering, uh, but uh, continues to trust in God and is eventually saved. And I think John wants us to see that everything really that is happening to Jesus, even at this point, is all according to God's plan, that everything written about him is finally being fulfilled in this one man. That if you like, all the promises of, of God in the Old Testament find their yes in Jesus, particularly at this point. This is the one point when Jesus dies, that it's all been finished. It's all been done. And it wasn't really until Jesus uh, gave his spirit later on, or gave up his spirit, I should say, uh, notice it wasn't taken away from him, that we really see that Jesus also is in total control. Uh, Jesus' saving work, in other words, is finished now. He did it all. There is nothing that remains undone. And that is why uh, those who turn to him can be so sure that they are saved. Uh, we um, know that we're going to heaven, not because of anything we've done, but because Jesus has done it all for us. It's so important for us to know that. Well, we've been encouraged uh, to look to Jesus, the, the man, and to look to Jesus, the king. But finally, I want to suggest that this final section in verses 31 uh, to 37 is really jo John's way of saying, look or behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Because it picks up and echoes what John the Baptist says in John chapter 1. Uh, because firstly, John wants us to know that Jesus truly died. When the soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, um, they found him already dead, and so they pierce his side, and it causes blood and water to pour out. Um, and I think this is just a shorthand way of saying Jesus really died. There was no swoon theory. There's no kind of uh, you know, idea that he just was unconscious and, that's why, and then recovered in the tomb. No, he was dead fully dead uh, he is like a lamb led to the slaughter here but actually uh, john wants us to, to, to recognize this incident actually leads us to two other scriptures which again uh, help us to understand the significance of the death of jesus and the first one is in verse 36 not one of their bones will be broken now what scripture is this referring to well it fulfills another psalm of david a messianic psalm in psalm 34 verse 20 which talks about that but it's even more than that because all throughout this story, we've been deliberately told again and again that this is the Passover. It's the day of preparation of the Passover. It's the Passover. And you can see that in verse 14 and 31. It's um, when this incident took place. And the Passover festival was a celebration remembering the time long ago when God rescued his people from being slaves in Egypt and led them out through the Red Sea to the Promised Land where they were to have their freedom forever. Uh, but the way they get there is by sacrificing a lamb. It was the night of Passover night. Uh, God was going to get, cause his angel of death to pass through all the households of Egypt. But what the Israelites were meant to do was to take a lamb, slaughter it, put the blood on the doorposts. And if you're in the household with the blood on the doorposts, then the angel of death wouldn't enter it and kill a firstborn of that household. They would be spared. It was clear sign that the lamb that was slaughtered was a substitute for the firstborn son so that the firstborn wouldn't die. And one of the criteria that was mandated and when the Israelites celebrated again and again was you cannot break the bones of the lamb. Even after the day had finished, you couldn't break the bones of the lamb. And here is John saying, Actual, actually, Jesus is the Passover lamb. That's why his bones could not be broken. Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. His sacrifice is a substitutionary death for us so that we could not 
uh, don't have to die. Metaphorically, what we do is we put the blood of Jesus over the doorposts of our hearts so that God's condemnation, God's angel of death, passes over us. And just one other verse, just quickly, uh, is they'll look on the one they have pierced. And this is talking about a prophecy 500 years before Jesus uh, where God refers to himself as the one they pierced. But then uh, when the people um, uh, come back to him, he'll pour out a spirit that they'll come back to him. And he says, then they'll realise what they've done, that they've pierced me. God's saying, you know, it's not like I'm indifferent to you rejecting me. It really does cut me to the bone. Uh, uh, but th when they come back, uh, he says on that day, later on he says, on that day a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from their sin and impurity. A wonderful image of cleansing. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Behold your King. Behold the man. He died as your substitute so that you could be forgiven, so that you could have eternal life in our Father's home forever and ever. Amen. That's Thanks for listening to today's talk. The Evangelical Union, or EU, is a student club on campus at Sydney University that seeks to proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. To join us or to find out more, please visit sydneyunieu.org.